You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another awesome episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul. My name is Rob. Thank you for joining us today. So happy that you have chosen to spend a few minutes of your day with us. Definitely appreciate it. Today we've got a very, uh, very poignant, new, nuanced, niche question uh, regarding mapping and specifically picks for the mapper. And uh, I think it's going to be a very good one. So let's go ahead and just dive right into it. If you're interested in learning how to conduct drone mapping from acquisition to processing and to even creating deliverables, you got to check out our Drone U mapping course. Drone U membership does offer a comprehensive mapping class. You can also check out the Props program, which is an organized, sequential, scenario based training that's built for people who thrive on structure. It's also built for teams. Check it out, propsflightschool.com or props.thedroneu.com. Check it out. G'day, Paul. G'day, Rob. Trav from Victoria, Australia again. So look, if a person was to use Pix4D Mapper to create a 3D model and absolute accuracy, even relative accuracy, is not that important, are there any pitfalls to watch out for? Is there an issue with someone just smashing through steps one to three in a single go? I really appreciate your time that you give to these podcasts. So thank you once again. Thank you once again, Trav. Follow-up question. I love it. Thank you for uh, um, hopping back onto the mic, so to speak. We're glad to hear from you again. So, yeah, I think this one's fairly cut and dry as far as you're concerned, right? Because it does matter. It does matter. And I will say there's a couple of caveats here, right? The acquisition methods that were used are going to dictate mm. the workflow as a whole, right? Because if you have a huge difference from your oblique imagery, from your double grid, et cetera, then you're going to have issues in running step one, two, and three. The way that I teach students to produce 3D deliverables is really to run step one first, um, especially dependent on the different types of acquisition methods that you used, you know, from orbital to free flight to double grids, single grids, et cetera. Depending on the combination of tools that you use to acquire imagery would provide uh, different workflows. For example, let's say you shot an orbit, free flights, and a double grid. Um, Pix4D teaches about merging models. You know, we teach also about aligning models, which is throwing everything into one project, running step one. And, you know, the reason you don't want to just crush step one, two, and three is oftentimes you can get multiple layers of grass, multiple layers of the house if the software can't actually accurately align the data itself. So I always tell everyone, run step one. If you've got a data alignment error or issue, you create manual tie points around the center subject. Um, and I have a very uh, special workflow of creating manual tie points that is extremely different from what Pix4D teaches to have all these data sets align. Um, I've taught it numerous times. In fact, our last exercise for the last mapping class, I proved this point and I can prove it over and over and over again. But on a general sense, you can run step one and two. The issue is that it's going to take so long to spin up uh, you know, number two, it's in your best interest to just run step one, see if you have any alignment errors in the data set, and then run step two. I do typically change uh, some of the processing settings in step two. Now, let's say you run step one and two, and you're ready to move to three. Oftentimes, we're going to be editing the point cloud, we're going to be deleting points from the point cloud to create better outputs in step three, but also in in uh, subsequent step two steps as well. Oftentimes, I run step one, step two, I'm, I have way too much noise in the model, and I'll start the project over and change the processing settings to remove points. Uh, you can remove and eliminate a lot of noise by increasing the minimum number of matches. 
But if your acquisition methodology doesn't provide enough photos to cover given areas, then that will not work. Other times when I have potential uh, issues with step one and step two, I will also use geometrically verified matching that helps remove a lot of noise oftentimes. But the long, uh, the, the succinct answer is no, I never rip step one, two, and three, depending on the acquisition uh, methodologies uh, or strategies, I will typically run just step one, make sure I don't have any issues, and then step two. And oftentimes, if step two is giving me a lot of missing or erroneous points and it needs a lot of point cloud cleanup, instead of going right into point cloud cleanup to then produce my other deliverables, I'll often change the style of processing or change the processing template as a whole and rerun step one and two before moving forward. So. Without giving away the farm or the mapping class, I think that's about as far as I'm willing to go. <laughs> <laughs> well, in that step between two and three, um, like you, there's pretty much always something to be cleaned up. Oh yeah, right. I and mean, uh, yeah, that, if I you want to, if you want a nice clean map, anyways. Well, I mean, as I was going through point cloud editing uh, the second time with the virtual mapping class, they were like, you know, what's like the minimum amount of time that you you look at these uh, maps and models. And I say, well, what I typically do is, you know, the 3D mesh is auto-generated in step two, and I'll just let it run. Because then when I turn that on, I can see where the erroneous points are causing the failures in the mesh. And then go through and clean up the model and at a minimum of 20 minutes by kind of going around the model in either a counterclockwise or clockwise fashion. Um, and then regenerate the 3D textured mesh and the other deliverables at that point. So Interesting. I've also spent up to 50 hours 49 to be exact, uh, cleaning up point I, clouds. So. I remember the project, yeah. I think you're talking about Denver. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple of questions come to mind. Um, isn't isn't that what is happening for those that use drone deploy? Is it's for all intents and purposes running one through three all at once? It is, and actually, and you know, for a while I came on the show and said how impressed I was with drone deploy, um, but my impressions have digressed because I finally learned that there is no means of merging data sets or aligning data sets. They literally just choose the best point cloud and then throw a mesh on top of it and say, here you go. Meaning it's not going to have as good a detail. Never. Yeah. No. Yeah. Never. So. And then so my second question, but that is what they do and it still per presents decent models, right? Depending mm -hmm. on it. So it all, oftentimes it depends on your need and, and the deliverable and who's using it and what they're using it for, just like pretty much every job. But then my second question is, what about the accuracy part of the question? How much does that change? I guess. Well, see, when you're, at, when, well, he said that accuracy doesn't matter. And for most 3D deliverables, it doesn't. Okay. So, so then it's not really an issue. No, it's not. But the gotcha. one thing I will say is if you do georeference your double grid and then throw oblique imagery in it, just make sure you remember the golden rule. Don't re-optimize more than three times. So <laughs> otherwise you lose everything and it's gone. Literally. Back to the site. It kind of reminds me of South Park. Hey, we're going to move your money over here. We're going to move that money over here and it's gone. <laughs> 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 so, <That's hilarious>. <laughs> <laughs> funny so, but not funny that's so true though <laughs> so <laughs> anyway make sure you have a fiduciary that's all I gotta say uh, but anyway uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys uh, but long story short is never just run step one two and three when it comes to 3D deliverables there is not a single cloud software out there that will produce a good 3D deliverable for you uh, in an effort to give Drone Deploy a fair run, what is Drone Deploy really good for? 2D ortho mosaics and volumetrics, not georeferencing. And it, once you learn the rules of GSD, the rules of marking uh, uh, GCPs, like the uh, trigonomic effect for zooming in all the way, marking photos in a circular fashion to reduce ellipsoid error, all of these things matter, all of them. So, um, you know, I, I know a lot of, uh, I feel like this is also why construction is moving away from geo-reference maps and models. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know what, they do their, they have their surveyor go out there, they do their as-built, and then from that point on, they don't need it anymore. They need literally a huge map or pano, as we'll call it in the state of California, pano uh, of a given site. Pretty pictures. Pretty much. <laughs> that are <laughs> stitched together. Yeah. 
to represent some sort of scale to the earth, but they're not perfectly scaled. Okay. So anyway, yeah, I which, digress. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a whole <laughs> yeah, other thing. That and uh, anyways, yeah. awesome. All right. Well, I hope that answered your question, Trav. Thank you again for sending in multiple questions. In fact, and uh, we hope to hear from you again. Ask droneute.com. A hundred percent. And thank you everyone for your support. And thank you everyone who is a drone you member. Uh, and I just want to say, I love the drone you members that get in there and really go ham. I absolutely love it. But if you're like me and you got a little bit of ADHD in you, it's okay. Check out our props program for a sequential organized content flow. Props pilot is built to create pilots to fly in any environment. Props mapper is built on top of pilot to add the mapping aspect. And then here's the thing. If you want to create the absolute most capable pilots that can solve problems in the field in any environment, check out Props Commander. You will not be disappointed. My name is Paul. And I'm Rob. And we believe in taking flight and being responsible. (laughs) 